Good evening. I'm Lucinda Gabriel, and today we are January 22nd, 2023. And so welcome. Welcome to this uh, new video, this new year. And uh, last week, well, not last week, but anyway, the last video that I did was uh, about preparing for the wedding. So whether it's an earthly, godly wedding or the wedding supper of the Lamb, that's what the last one was about. So really, you know, preparing for the wedding day, if you will. And so this week, I really felt uh, that on my heart to do something that was about more preparing for the marriage itself, because there's there's the wedding, the wedding day, and then there's the marriage, but preparing for the marriage. And next week, I want to speak about how to live the marriage. So what's that all about, you know, uh, in light of eternity? And then, uh, yeah, and I, after that, there's still more to come that the Lord has been putting on my heart. So I'm really excited about the next uh, live videos that I will share with you. And um, and I know it seems kind of odd, even in my spirit, I feel, you know, to, to be speaking about these things. With everything that's going on in the world, we know where things are headed. But at the same time, uh, yeah, it's it's meant to be because you know what? we are to be getting excited about the marriage supper of the lamb right we are going we are the bride of christ we're going to be married with jesus and live with him in eternity so all of these videos are about preparing for that but also about preparing for marriage on earth because i've met like i said a lot of younger people lately and uh, people that are looking to get married people that have met someone and and so all you know, they all have these questions, and I just really felt that God put it on my heart to share these things with you and to help you best prepare. Because you know what? Getting married is the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, thing that you will ever do in your life. It's the biggest decision you'll ever make. And it's the most, yeah, important one. It's the one you want to get right. You don't want to get this one wrong. So, as I explained last time, there are parallels between both the earthly and the heavenly wedding. So for the earthly wedding, God, he planned a mission for the man. And then he chooses and prepares, he chooses and prepares a perfect partner, a helper, a bride for the man. And they develop a relationship before the wedding. They get to know each other, not intimately, but they get to know each other's brothers and sisters, as we say. And they stay pure and chaste and they do not commit sin before the wedding so this is the godly way biblical way that it was planned by god and there's also coming the marriage supper of the lamb right the wedding supper of the lamb and god has a plan and has a vision for his son and groom jesus and he chose us believers as the bride and he prepares us to be the bride of christ right and we are to develop, develop a relationship with Jesus before the wedding feast. And it's all about a kingdom. You know, it's about the king and it's about the kingdom. And it's about a relationship with the king before he comes. It's not about religion. Religion has nothing to do with this. And I really, really encourage you to read your Bible to understand all of this correctly. So we are to develop a relationship with Jesus before the wedding feast which is coming and when Jesus comes back and which is very soon. So we are commanded to stay pure, chaste and righteous. We do not commit sin nor adultery with other gods, just like we wouldn't, you know, commit uh, adultery uh, on someone that we're, you know, uh, you know fiancéed with. Like we would not commit sin and be with anyone else. We are not supposed to be with any other gods besides Jesus, right? So, do you see how amazing, how amazing this is, right? So, it's all the same. And so, this week I feel called to speak to you about preparing for marriage itself. Preparing for marriage is likened to preparing for eternity. So, how do we prepare for eternity? You know, know that everything we do is to bring glory to God. Every day, every decision we make, every tiny little decision to make, we need to be asking ourselves, does this bring glory to God? So it's the same thing. We should be bringing glory to God in everything, and even our marriage. And our aim is to be more Christ-like each and every day. So I believe marriage and parenthood can prepare us for heaven. That's what came to me this week about 
Yeah, everything we do here prepares us for heaven, right? But especially marriage and parenthood. And this came to me today was that when we arrived in Manitoba, we were a team of 14 people, and that includes seven adults and seven children. And we lived there with three more people, so that's 17 of us living together, having meals together, all you know, every day, three meals a day. And while I was there in the beginning, I fell on this verse, and it's in Psalms 133. And it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell, which is to live together, in unity, in harmony. And it is like the precious oil of consecration poured on the head, coming down from the beard, even the beard of Aaron, coming down upon the edge of his priestly robes, consecrating the whole body, the whole body. And so that's what it does. It consecrates the whole body when we live together. And we are the body of Christ, right? It is like the dew of Mount Hermon coming down on the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So I believe that when we live together, when we come together, we're supposed to live in harmony and uh, unity. And that's what prepares us. You know for eternal life because we have to love and forgive one another and so uh, it really sharpens us and, and shapes us into being more Christ-like each and every day so the whole point of marriage and community is unity and harmony so we come together in marriage and community to be in harmony and unity and give glory to God it's all ultimately to bring glory to God right so in the book of Acts, verse 46, we read that the first disciples were in one accord or one mind. So there was unity and harmony amongst the believers. And there was no division except for the division that Satan brought, you know, with his lies afterwards, right? So the world, as we see it, has a distorted view about marriage. And the people are influenced by culture, and culture is really determined by Satan, who has taken everything that is sacred and holy to God and has turned it all into a mockery that includes marriage. And marriage is, first of all, between a man and a woman. And it is a covenant, a blood covenant, not unlike the covenant that God had between him and Abraham and Jesus had has with us believers, right? So the Lord told me one morning, marriage is not about what you can get, but about what you can give. So we have to look at what can we bring to a marriage. So this is true about a godly earthly marriage as it is also true about our future heavenly marriage with Jesus. So in the secular world, marriages, people are looking for what they can get. And they are more concerned about being loved than rather than being loving. Right? And I know that because I was like that too. And it's the me, me, me culture of today that we live in. It's all about the self, self-love, self-care, me, 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 me. What's in it for me, right? And in today's society, in the secular world, most people come together for what they can get out of living together or marriage. And they don't think about what they can bring. And like I shared last week, the three main reasons why people actually do get married is to find someone to fill that emptiness inside that really only Jesus can fill. Second is to have sex, and most people don't even have to get married for that anymore because, you know, it's so free and, you know, everybody does it, and, ex you know, except for the ones that are trying to live a godly life. And three, people are trying to accumulate material wealth. That's the three reasons why people basically come together. In God's kingdom, it's totally different. The design is that a man is joined to his wife to serve God. That's what it boils down to. Like the ultimate purpose is to serve God, to honor and bring glory to God. So the man is first given a vision, a responsibility, a task, and then God chooses and prepares the perfect helper, a wife that will help him to accomplish the task that God has given him, and God brings her to him afterwards. So there's nothing about the self in God's kingdom. Selflessness is the very essence of the gospel. Love is selflessness. God is love, right? God is selfless. And according to the dictionary, to be selfless means to be concerned more with the needs and the wishes of others than with one's own. And that's what true love is. And that is what the gospel is to me. Because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him 
should not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Mark 10, 46, whoever desires to become great amongst you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So in the kingdom of God, life in general is not about us, but about serving others, right? It is all about being selfless, laying down our lives for others, and that includes our husbands and our wives. Both the man and woman who are properly born again, meaning, you know, they repent, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, in God's kingdom, they do not have this empty feeling, a void that needs to be filled up by someone else because they're already filled with Jesus. They don't need someone to fill their life. So our life is complete already and it's full with Jesus. And so we are not out there seeking a husband or seeking a wife. We shouldn't be anyway if we're really truly born again. We should be seeking God. And God, you know, He's the one that, that lays out our life, right? We can, we can plan our lives, but He's the one that lays out the steps, the Bible says. Jesus said, Seek you first the kingdom of God and, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we need to be focusing on God's kingdom and staying right with God, staying out of sin. Right? His righteousness means to be without sin and focus on the work that He's planned for us in advance because... It says that the Bible plan things for us. We don't seek for a spouse, but if it's God's will that we have one, He will let us know. And I want you to know that He does speak to us today, because I've heard sermons of pastors say, oh, God doesn't speak to us, but that's not true. God really speaks. You can hear Him clearly in your head, in your heart, and it's not feelings. It's got nothing to do with feelings. It's got to do with faith. We don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. So, and faith is hearing the Word of God. So many believers that I met were not searching for that wife or husband, but God spoke to them directly and told them that He would bring them someone. Some people without notice were told very specifically and clearly that a certain person would be their spouse. And this revelation from God was confirmed through another person who had heard from God on the subject. So God, you know, He'll speak to you, but He'll also speak to other people. Like you need to have confirmation, right? So if you believe you heard from God about someone in particular, pray. Pray for more confirmation. You want to be 200% sure of God's will. Because not being in God's will can be disastrous, right? Like B, uh, let me make this very clear. Yeah, that it's not about feelings. I, I want to reiterate, it's not about feelings. It's about faith, you know. We believers do not walk by feeling or sight. We walk by faith, and faith comes from hearing the Word of God. This means that we really need to hear God's voice on the subject, whether it's in our heart or our head or even a dream. But don't only rely on feelings, because feelings can be deceiving, especially when hormones are involved. And you want to be careful about getting any hormones activated. And I talked about that in my last video that was called Prepare for the Wedding. Right? So, marriage preparation. God prepares a person for marriage, and sometimes unknowingly to them. So a young woman that I met lately talked about how she was working as a caretaker for an elderly lady, and she was studying to be a nurse and taking care of this lady. And she worked really hard, you know, inside and outside the house and caring, you know, for, for the house in general. And one day she asked God, why? Why did you send me here, you know, to this person and all this work? And, and the Lord answered her, and He said, I am preparing you for marriage. And that was absolutely amazing. So the Lord does prepare people for marriage by helping them develop this character and the skills that they will need, right? And um, it's, it's all about being loving and caring. It's not about ourselves. So, you know, if you want to be married, learn the art of caring for a home and other people because marriage is not about what others can do for you but about what you can do to contribute to make the marriage life work and to help your husband, your wife, well, your husband, to, um, to fulfill his role, you know, the, the vision, uh, the plan that God has for his life. That's what it's all about. So I believe God wants his children to be ready and prepared for marriage. And if you are a parent, 
Would you want your daughter to marry a guy who is immature and irresponsible? Certainly not. So neither does God. God wants the best for his children, so we should be determined to be our best before desiring to enter marriage as well. So a man's role in marriage. The man is supposed to be the provider, the protector, and the spiritual leader of the family. He is the guy, right? He is called to be a godly husband and father. And as provider, a man should have a job, be going to school to get a future job, or at least be known to be able to keep a job right and maybe God called him into a mission to be a missionary and so if he has been called him like he should be already proving that he can do the work and that God is providing for him right so as a spiritual leader of the house he needs to have a real relationship with God he needs to be born again to be hearing and heeding God's voice and he should have a track record of how God has been leading him in his life so you want to be checking on this stuff a true godly man will be a great leader for his household, and that's what he's called to be. The Bible says that the man is the head of the household, so he needs to be clearly hearing from God. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So this does not mean that the wife is any way inferior, but she does submit to her husband. She's not inadequate or less important or less responsible than her husband. Only an unwise man would reject his, his wife's opinions and assistance because the Lord has created her to be his best resource, right? Husband and wife are to discuss everything, but ultimately the man has the responsibility to decide what is best for the whole family and all the while taking into consideration everyone's needs. So everything also should be brought before the Lord before making a final decision on any big subject. So we are called to be servants to one another. Uh, men are leaders of the family and they're also servants, right? And so women, we have the responsibility to pray for our men. Men are called to be faithful and responsible. And so men are to be faithful to God and their wives and be responsible towards their family, considering their needs and not neglecting them over the work um, or the ministry, right? So 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, Paul compares the responsibility of a church elder to that of a husband and father in his home. He says he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him and that he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? So the man is to pray for his wife and children and guide them with godly wisdom, right? So ask God, ask God to help you become the godly man that he intended you to be. And if you're a woman and you're listening to this, you can pray to God to help your husband or your future husband to become the godly man that God intends him to be as well. And then you need to step back and let God work. Too often, women want godly men, but they have a difficult time letting them lead, right? Women are bossy, and you need to step down and let the man lead. Ask God to help you to step down and submit to others, starting with your father and your brothers, right? As long as they don't lead you into sin, we are to submit. My own life became so much easier when I submitted to God, and I let go, and I let God, and I asked God to lead me in my life. And I don't want anything that God doesn't want. But if God wants it, I trust that He knows best. And even myself, um, you know, I've, I've had to learn to submit to, to even brothers, you know, that we work with. And, and I find, you know what, when I let go, it was comforting. It was comforting to know that I don't need to know everything. I don't need to control everything. I don't need to do everything, you know. I can just, um, yeah, just submit and, and do what is necessary and let somebody else be in charge. And that was such a relief for me. Submitting to a man who submitted to God should be comforting and stress relieving, right? So, how does a woman prepare? The woman is designed to be the helper of the man. Her role is to be a godly wife and mother. Sadly today, many young women have not been taught properly by their mothers about how to care for a husband, a home, or children, and that's because many homes are broken today. The enemy, the devil, is set on breaking the family unit 
and he has succeeded in many homes, including many Christian homes. The divorce rate is high and children go from one parent's home to the other. And often parents are more concerned with finding a new mate than raising their own children properly, right? We see it all the time. I've noticed that many young girls do not even have any cooking skills, any sewing skills. And, you know, these are essential skills to have and they're lost in these generations, right? In the last couple of generations. And most young girls even lack the interest in learning as well. I've met people that I've I had to teach, you know, how to make bread, how to make pies and stuff like that because they just didn't know. They had no interest when they were growing up. But to be a good wife and a homemaker is very important if you want to have a happy and married life. You want to take care of your husband. You want to take care of your children, right? So I encourage you to read Proverbs 31 about the virtuous wife. We see in the Bible, God shows us and tells us how to be a good wife. Every question you ever have about anything, it's in the Bible. The answer is in there somewhere. Just ask God to show you where it is. There's an answer for everything. Pray to God to help you develop the godly qualities that you will need, right? So let's look at some qualities and character uh, of a godly woman. On earth, we are born again believers. We are to prepare ourselves also as the bride of Christ, right? We read in Revelation 19, 9, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the wedding feast. And his wife, the bride, has made herself ready. That's us. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Some places say the righteous acts. So we are called to be righteous. And what are righteous qualities? Well, according to the Amplified Version, it says ethical conduct, personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character of believers. And also, there's the fruits of the Spirit, right? We're called, uh, the when we have the Holy Spirit, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we are to have all of these qualities as well if we truly have the Holy Spirit. So um, if we don't have this, we should pray for the Holy Spirit or pray for God to help us develop, give us the grace to develop these wonderful qualities to be more and more like Jesus. So let's look at some qualities that God admires. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the inc incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So God likes a woman to have incorruptible beauty, a gentle and quiet spirit, right? And I'm going to list out a few words that we find in the Bible uh, characteristics that women should have wise kind faithful loyal sober honorable trustworthy gracious courageous generous industrious prudent strong caring capable dutiful modest pure meek and quiet priceless trusting prayerful prophetic ministering devout fearing the Lord right these are all qualities that we should be seeking and in some Bibles, like I said, it talks about righteous acts or good deeds. So there's also a mentioning of that. And know that God prepared good deeds for us in advance that we're supposed to walk into, right? And um, in Revelation 22, 12, it says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. So that means there are rewards for things that we've done. So what are we called to be doing, right? And we have been given, of course, the ministry of reconciliation. Each and every one of us, you know, if you're born again, you have a job. And it's the ministry of reconciliation to help people reconcile with God. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ's kingdom. We have all been given a commission. Mark 16, verse 15 to 18, it says, And he said to them, Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So we are called to be disciples and to make disciples. And what is a disciple? Well, it's someone that looks and acts like Jesus. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. 
Therefore, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always through the very end of age. So we are called to share the gospel, baptize people, make disciples, and we make disciples, right? Jesus said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all else will be given unto you. So seek God's kingdom first. The most important thing that you can do to prepare for marriage is to serve God first. Be seeking his kingdom. Nothing is more honorable, nothing is more true and more right and more beautiful than the feet uh, the, 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 that goes to share the gospel. So the person that goes out there and just this radiates joy and peace and love and that shares the good news with people because people everywhere are hungry and thirsty and they're dying. They need, they need someone to pray for them. And so our job as a born again believer is to go. It says go and make disciples and never lose sight of this, right? This is our first job. Never lose sight of making disciples. And this will not change once you're married. The only difference is you will have someone to do it with. You will serve God together, right? And so, in case you're wondering about how to be born again, Acts 2.38 lays it out. Go and read the book of Acts, chapter 2. Peter said to them, and this was to the, uh, the Jewish people, when Peter was saying to them, you know that man Jesus that you crucified on the cross? Well, he was your promised king, right? That's what he said. He was your promised king, the prophet, the, the, the king, the Messiah. And you crucified him. You killed your king, he said to them. And they were cut to the heart. And they're like, well, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said to them, repent. Turn away from your sin. Hate it, you know. And let every one of you be baptized, immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That's the washing away of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's how we become born again. And that's how we enter into God's kingdom. So if you have questions about that part, just write me. And, you know, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased that so many people have been reaching out to me lately. I've had six people reach out in the past month to be baptized. Quebec is, is God is raising up an army. And it's so amazing. And uh, if people are waking up to the truth. And I just strongly encourage you. If you didn't follow me this month on my Facebook page where I shared the book of John, every day, one chapter, read one chapter a day. Just give five minutes. That's all I ask is five minutes a day to read the book of John for 21 days. And next month in February, I'm going to start the book of Acts online on my Facebook page. And just just read it. Just read it. So, you know, we need to start preparing ourselves for the wedding feast of the Lamb and for the marriage, you know, which is eternity with Jesus Christ. And if you on earth are feeling led by God to be married with someone, well, I strongly encourage you to apply the things that the Lord put on my heart to share with you to be, to become that godly woman, that godly man that, you know, God intends you to be, to, to live you know, a marriage with someone. So next week, God willing, I will speak to you about the marriage life itself in light of eternity. And I'm really excited to share that with you because... God is giving so many wonderful revelations about that. It's not, marriage is not the way that we see it in the world. And very, 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 very few people actually live a godly marriage the way we're supposed to. And it just makes me think about how Jesus said, wide is the road to perdition and narrow is the gate to, to heaven. And difficult is the way and few people find it. Well, I say very few people are living the godly marriage that we are called to live. So I'm excited about sharing that with you next week. So that's it. God bless you. And uh, I really hope that you enjoyed this message and that it spoke to you. And um, yes, I pray that it was a blessing. So God bless you. And I'll see you next week. God willing. Bye-bye.